Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're here with Dr. Kara Chris to talk about vaccine distribution uh, with a presentation, and we will take your questions as well. A reminder that this session is on the record, and we're setting up everyone to uh, record. If you can't record, please ping me in the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Christ. Thanks, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. For those that don't know me, I'm Dr. Kara Christ. I'm the director for the Arizona Department of Health Services, and I hope everyone had a great week and a wonderful Memorial Day. Um, as usual, I will give a brief presentation and leave time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you might have. So as typically, we will start with our uh, data. You can see that over the last several months, we have seen a decrease in our um, number of cases per week, in addition, uh, a stabilizing over the last several weeks of cases. We have seen a slight trending down over the last three to four weeks, so that is a good sign. And this mirrors our uh, percent positivity in hospital usage as well. Here is our epi curve with the important events laid over uh, on top of it so that we can see what those events might have had an impact on. Um, as right now, you can see that our daily number of cases mirrors our weekly trends. So we had seen a significant decrease since the beginning of January um, with a leveling off of cases and uh, a slight decline over the last couple of weeks. We are seeing the same trend in our percent positivity. So this looks a little bit different than what's on our website. Um, but this is the total number of tests perform performed in both uh, unique individuals as well as those that are getting repeat tests and have been tested prior. We saw a significant decrease from the beginning of January um, through the first three months of the year, a, a stabilization and leveling off in our percent positivity. And over the last few weeks have seen a uh, slight decrease back down. Using our total tests performed in Arizona, which we think is a more accurate representation of community transmission, we have been below 4% uh, positivity over the last couple of weeks, which again is a good sign. Our hospital usage for our inpatient medical surgical beds uh, remains low and has remained stable over the last couple of months. This is a, a, another good indicator um, uh, that we're watching in the community. We did have a significant decrease from our highs back in January and have stayed stable. And we see that same pattern with a little bit of a decrease in our ICU beds that are in use. And I, I apologize for those that haven't seen these graphs before. Um, orange is the ICU beds that are being used by COVID patients. Blue is ICU beds that are in use by non-COVID patients. And the gray is uh, uh, unoccupied ICU beds. And that's the same for our inpatient beds. So the yellow orange is the uh, beds that are in use for our uh, COVID patients, blue are non-COVID patients, and gray are unoccupied or available beds at our hospitals statewide. And then finally, one of the other indicators that we have been watching since the beginning of the pandemic has been our COVID-like illness syndromic surveillance. And so this is the average between our inpatient and emergency room use, and you can see it mirrors our, our peaks that we experienced and is mirroring our current uh, our current capacity right now, hospital usage for COVID-like illness is, is relatively low. So with that, I will move on to our COVID vaccine uh, distribution. To date, uh, 5.9, almost 6 million doses of COVID have been administered to almost 3.4 million individuals. We have 2.8 million individuals who have been fully vaccinated and about 47% of Arizona's total population has received at least one vaccine, and 39% of the population has been fully vaccinated. So that includes those that are under the age of 12 who may uh, not, um, who are not eligible currently to get vaccinated for COVID-19. This differs a little bit from the CDC's uh, estimates. CDC gets reports from entities that we may not. They are putting us at about 51, 52% of our population um, vaccinated. And that may account, uh, some of our federal partners, federal entities and tribal entities do not need to report to the state. We do have good reporting relationships with them, but we don't get 100% of those reports. 
We recently received recognition though, so we were very excited from the CDC for vaccinating over 80% of those that are 65 years and older here in Arizona. CDC's goal has been to get 70% of the adult population that is aged 18 and older vaccinated by the 4th of July. So we are continuing to work towards that goal and to get as many Arizonans vaccinated um, as we can as quickly as possible. This is a screenshot from our uh, web, our, our dashboard on our website. This is the vaccine coverage by age. Uh, just so everyone's aware, we estimate a population of about 7.2 million Arizonans. Um, that does include about 1.6 million Arizonans who are under the age of 18 years. Um, one of the groups that we've been watching that's a little bit more difficult to separate out on our graphs, but we've got about 16% of our 12 to 15 year olds, of which we estimate there to be about 385,000 uh, Arizonans in that age group, um, but about 16% of those have been vaccinated. Um, we are uh, working to expand opportunities for that age group to get vaccinated and are working with our schools and our local health departments to encourage uh, adolescent vaccination, which is imp an important strategy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So for our vaccine administration sites, we have over 1,600 provider sites that have received vaccine. And um, we have over 300 locations that are offering the Pfizer vaccine. And the reason that the Pfizer vaccine is important is because that is the vaccine that is available to those that are 12 and older. For our Johnson & Johnson and Moderna, that would um, those are 18 and older. So if you've got an adolescent that you're trying to get vaccinated, please make sure that you look for a Pfizer site. We've got over 975 pharmacies that have received vaccine. Um, and that includes Fry's, Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, Costco, Bashes and Food City, as well as Albertsons and Safeway. So statewide, we have a lot of pharmacies that are participating in the program. We've, we've briefed you on our efforts to get our long-term care facilities uh, vaccinated for both their staff and their residents. That was one of our priorities early on in our vaccination efforts. And to date, over 1,480 long-term care facilities did receive vaccination from the CDC Long-Term Care Partner Pharmacy Partnership Program. And um, we have administered over 1,700 vaccination events through our uh, vaccine management system, so the VMS. Um, that includes our state fix sites, mobile pop-up events, community events. Um, there's a large number of those. They are getting updated in a real-time manner. Uh, we do have an app now that has been updated with a feature to search by vaccine type for families that are interested in finding Pfizer. Um, there's a QR code that you can use to access that information. We have also updated our Find Vaccine webpage. It is searchable by vaccine type. So if you pull uh, over on the arrow on the left hand side, it will bring up those three bars. Just make sure that you select Pfizer. Um, which is the top the the top uh, vaccine selection, and that will come up with all of the entities across the state that have uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And so now all of our providers uh, can directly order vaccine, all of our onboarded vac uh, providers. Uh, they can order Pfizer, Moderna, or Janssen, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So if a provider has a preference to administer a one-dose vaccine or a two-dose vaccine or has the ability to store Pfizer, they are welcome to uh, begin ordering that. As of today, we have had 267 orders placed by our provider population for a total of 57,860 doses ordered. So we've got over 50,000 doses that are currently in um, doctor's offices around the state. You can see here that we are seeing a slowing in our vaccination rate. So we um, had significantly ramped up and increased vaccination. You can see over the last few uh, weeks, we're seeing a significant decline in the vaccines administered. A lot of that will be second doses from those from the, the previous week. Um, and you can see that we, we've seen a significant decline at our state pod vaccination sites. And so we, we as we've said for weeks, demand is decreasing. Um, we, we know that we need to encourage those, answer questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, to ensure people that these are safe, they're effective, they're free, and they're extremely effective in preventing hospitalization and death. 
Um, and so using this, this data, we have administered over 1.6 million doses of vaccine um, at our state sites to nearly 900,000 individuals across um, all of our seven pods since we opened them up January 11th. Um, State Farm Stadium was our, was our highest performing pod. It was nationally recognized. It was uh, a 24-7 model that um, on we were able to administer over 12,000 doses um, and, and did so uh, during our peak uh, week of administering vaccine. All of our state sites, including State Farm, transitioned to indoor locations. Um, that occurred uh, through April and May. Um, and now, given the lack of demand and the need to be um, more in the community at these pop-up events, we will be demobilizing and phasing out the state pods that will occur. Um, our last state pod will uh, close on June 28th. So we're encouraging individuals who would like to receive both vaccine doses at one of our state-run vaccination sites. They should visit today or tomorrow. The last day that we will be scheduling uh, second dose appointments will be uh, June 5th because 21 days later would be June 26th, June 27th, or June 28th. So we want to make sure that Arizonans know that if they want to get vaccinated at, to, to, at a state site, please go as soon as possible to get um, uh, to get vaccinated. And our state vaccination sites, just to remind everybody, was just one part of our vaccination strategy. Our goal has been to get vaccine um, into places where people normally receive their health care. So where they normally get their flu shots, where they can talk to a health care provider that they, they trust, we know that that is one of, um, one of the ways that we've been told that Arizonans would feel comfortable in um, listening to a health care provider and then getting the vaccine. So as we look to phase out, we recommend that if you are going to a state vaccination site that you check the schedule for the hours and days of operation. Um, starting two weeks ago, we started uh, paring down uh, the hours and days that our state pods were operating. So you can see that Gila River Arena is open um, daily from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. except for a couple of blackout dates where they had events. Um, that will be the last uh, the last state site in operation, it will close um, on June 28th. And so if there are other sites that you're interested in um, looking at, please make sure that you check their last day of operation and the hours that they are operating. We will continue. Um, while we say that June 5th is the last day that you can receive a first dose, and then get a second dose appointment at a state site. We will still provide first doses at the state site until we close. And we will provide information through a QR code um, on where people can go to get their second dose at a nearby pharmacy or other location. You can still book appointments through the 28th by going to podvaccine.azdhs.gov or by calling our call center. Um, if you want a faster uh, appointment time, we would recommend that you make an appointment. All of the information is entered in before you get there, so it makes the, the appointment run very smoothly, but we still accept walk-ins and um, still provide a relatively quick experience to get vaccinated. And all of our state sites do vaccinate those 12 and older. Um, we would. The thing that we require is that a parent or legal guardian accompany that minor to the uh, vaccination site so that they can attest that they are the parent or legal guardian and consent to the, uh, the vaccination. All right, so one of the things that we have been working in Arizona on is expanding vaccine access and ensuring um, equity to the vaccine. So you will see that we are gonna shift our focus to from our state uh, mass vaccination pots to our community-based vaccination opportunities. So again, we're gonna phase those um, state-run vaccination sites out by June 28th and increase the number of neighborhood options like pharmacies, doctor's offices, pop-up clinics, community events at schools. You will start to see them. Um, we have awarded 13 providers, state contracts to operate pop-up clinics, mobile clinics. One of those providers is the Equality Health Foundation who partners with Arizona and ADHS and Adelante Healthcare on their one community initiative 
They have um, a number of events planned. You can go to their website or call their, their um, hotline to find out more information and their events um, are also posted on our Find Vaccine website. Um, but we are looking to expand those opportunities. We were very pleased when we were identified by CDC as a leader in underserved, in vaccinating our underserved community than other states. That was uh, issued in a recent um, morbidity and mortality weekly report um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have worked very closely with our partners to ensure that there's vaccine access for vulnerable and homebound populations. That includes the long-term care facilities that we, we've talked about since the beginning, as well as correctional facilities. Our um, Arizona correctional facilities have reported that they've reached nearly herd immunity with a, over 70% vaccinated through their program that we've done in partnership with them. And then also our long-term care uh, partnership with our long-term care facilities um, to do that. We are looking at doing drive time analyses uh, for our rural, rural and urban areas in Arizona to look uh, to see if there are places where we need to, to go farther into the community to reduce some of those drive times and ensure that there is equitable access to vaccine. So in addition to uh, the efforts by our local and county health departments and community groups, we are advancing our targeted outreach in underserved areas of Phoenix, Mesa, and Yuma County. Again, I'm, I'm, many of you have sat on our telephone town halls that we've provided in both English and Spanish. We've done targeted social media posts in both English and Spanish, and we've done door-to-door -door outreach. Um, on the 22nd, we held a uh, event where we launched our door-to-door -door campaign in the Phoenix City Council District 7 and 8. And that was really to go door to door to talk one on one with individuals to explain the benefits of, of vaccination and help direct them to nearby uh, providers. We actually held a vaccine event at that event that day. Um, again, you can um, go to the One Community Initiative uh, website. Um, or call their hotline to find um, some of the community events that are being offered in, um, in those areas. This is not only a central Arizona uh, initiative, but there's also communi uh, community-based vac vaccination events in our southern and northern counties as well. And so the University of Arizona, Yuma, and NAU pods have um, established a hub and spoke model where they utilize uh, their, their pod sites as, a, uh, as the hub, and then they do mobile pop-up events off of that farther into the community. Pima County has launched some um, successful initiatives, um, including Vax After Dark, and then Yuma County has kicked off uh, teen nights in order to increase access to vaccines during the evening hours and to reach populations that may not, um, may not consider being vaccinated unless they're approached. So we have been working with those providers to, um, to identify unique opportunities that can encourage Arizonans to get vaccinated. And tomorrow we have a family vaccination event in partnership with the Diamondbacks and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Um, this will be an event that offers Pfizer vaccination for um, ages 12 and up. Participating families who come down to visit us at Chase Field will have an opportunity to run the bases, take a family photo on the field. There's some activities. We will also have a second dose event there. Um, and uh, those that get fully vaccinated will receive a free uh, Diamondbacks ticket to a, uh, to a game of their choice out of, I, I believe it's out of four or five games that you get to choose from. So that's very exciting. You can always walk in if you find that you are suddenly free tomorrow, or you can schedule appointment if you're like me and that makes you feel better. Um, I always like to have appointments. So um, both of those are available, but we would love to see everybody down there um, getting vaccinated at this, this um, really cool family event. Again, um, as we've opened this up to providers, I want to stress how important our voice of our healthcare providers are to our patients in Arizona. They are identified as one of the most trusted sources of information. And so we encourage our providers to talk to their patients about getting the vaccine, the benefits of the vaccine, that it's safe and effective. 
um, and potentially offer the vaccine in their office um, to their patients so to, to provide that convenience. We have a lot of communication tools that are available to help our providers um, be able to answer questions, to know more about the vaccine so that they feel confident about recommending this. And all of that can be found on our website at azdhs.gov. We've also, with uh, our uh, 12 and above becoming eligible uh, for Pfizer, we have developed uh, educational materials for youth and families. So um, we uh, have some of these on our website. So if you are looking to um, work with that aged population, you are more than welcome to download these, uh, these tools and pass them out. We've been working with um, the One Community Initiative and some of our school districts to get information out so that parents and families feel comfortable about getting their, their young ones vaccinated. And again, for our providers, it is still currently uh, required that you become an onboarded pandemic vaccine provider. And so for those that are still looking at how to do that, we have an, a webpage where providers can go. It'll walk them through on how to become an onboarded provider, what is necessary for that. It has all of the applications, frequently asked questions, and information that a provider may need to know to become a vaccinator for COVID-19. And just a couple of other announcements. Uh, uh, as we head into the summer and looking towards the fall, we wanna make sure that our, our, our children are fully protected. And so um, one of the ways that we protect our kids is having them fully immunized, not only against COVID-19, but against a number of other communicable diseases um, that can um, be harmful to their health. And so, we are seeing decreased childhood routine immunizations um, through the pandemic. We are encouraging parents and providers to talk about catching um, those kids up. If you are a pediatric provider and want to provide the Pfizer vaccine, you no longer have to wait the 14 days between the administration of the COVID-19 vaccine and any other vaccine. They can be administered at the same time, which will make it much easier. Um, we encourage families, if you have any hesitation, to talk to your provider about um, not only the COVID-19 vaccine, but all school-required uh, immunizations. Um, you can find additional uh, information on our website. You can also find provider locations by going to Find Vaccine or uh, vaccines.gov. Recently, the CDC issued an MMWR uh, about the importance for vaccinating our adolescent population. So we, we've talked throughout the pandemic about how those over the age of 65, those with underlying medical conditions are most at risk for bad outcomes um, during the pandemic. Um, as the pandemic has progressed and as we've been successful in vaccinating a large portion of our elderly population in Arizona, what we're starting to see is a shift in who we are seeing hospitalized in, um, in, in the United States. The MMWR does point that adolescent hospitalization rates for COVID-19 increased during March um, and April. We are seeing a similar trend here in Arizona. Um, approximately right now, our hospitalizations do remain low. Approximately 7% of inpatient hospitalizations are associated with COVID. The number of adolescent hospitalizations is extremely low and death is very rare. Um, about 1% of the adolescent cases um, have been hospitalized in 2021 with about 4.2% of those hospitalized requiring an ICU admission. We have seen a small increase in the proportion of adolescents hospitalized compared to the beginning of this year. In January, 1% of all COVID hospitalizations were in children between the ages of 12 and 17. In May, it was 1.5% that were between the ages of 12 and 17. What, what is very important is that this represents a very small number of adolescents, 20 hospitalizations between the ages of 12 to 17 in May of 2021. However, um, what this highlights is that even those without significant risk factors or without those uh, known age groups can be in danger of having 
um, an outcome of hospitalization, potentially requiring ventilation. So this, the reason that it's important to show even the slight increase in, vac in um, hospitalization is to demonstrate how important it is to get vaccinated to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And one of the things that you'll also see a shift in our messaging is um, the messaging to our providers. When our vaccine was very, very limited and we had such high demand, care was taken not to waste a single dose. That was one of our main goals. We wanted to make sure that every dose made it into an arm. As our supply increases and as the demand um, decreases, what we want to ensure, while we want to minimize wastage, what we don't want to, to waste is the opportunity to get vaccine in an arm. So uh, we are working with our providers to let them know while we want to minimize waste to open a vial to give a vaccine to one or two people is uh, an acceptable practice to make sure that we are catching every eligible person and vaccinating them when they are willing. So we have placed this um, new guidance. This is guidance that's consistent with the CDC guidance um, on our website for providers that are interested. But the main message is please don't miss a vaccination opportunity. And finally, um, one of the things that we were very excited about was that our vaccine management system was honored for state government IT innovation. We, uh, our vaccine management system um, won a state scoop 50 award. Um, this is for our podvaccine.azdhs.gov. It is currently available in Spanish and English. Um, we had to rapidly build this uh, product and continuously enhance it based on feedback and based on issues we identified to improve the patient experience. Um, to date, it has managed more than 1,700 vaccination events and has supported uh, patients in booking 2.6 million appointments to date. And so, um, with that management system, it was launched in less than three weeks to support our providers statewide to create an all-in-one system for scheduling, administering the vaccine, and reporting the vaccine then back to our uh, immunization information system. And so we have worked. Um, it, it, it paid off. We've got a, a, a good system now that can manage lots and lots of vaccination appointments and administration. Um, and so we were very pleased that we were recognized with the State Scoop 50 Award. And with that, I will turn it over to questions. Thank you, Dr. Christ. Our first question is from Nicole Grigg. Hi, Nicole. Hi, oh, there you are. Hi. Can you hear me now? I can. The last few, I have not asked a question. So I have one thing I want to clarify and then two questions, please. Yeah. Okay, so when you say 1,600 provider sites have received the vaccine supplies, does that mean, how many have been onboarded though? So has everyone who has onboarded received the vaccine? Yes, so those are the providers that we're aware of they've either been onboarded through our system or they've been federally onboarded if they're if it's like a CVS or a Walgreens. So we know that 1600 providers they have to be onboarded in order to receive that vaccine. Okay, so there's not like doctors offices waiting to get the vaccine who have been onboarded. No, it it is open to onboarded providers to order. Yes. And so some of them we may still be working with to bring them up to, you know, the ability to be able to order and onboard. Um so there may be some that are waiting in that process as we work with them, but all the the onboarded providers should be able to order vaccine um pretty easily. Thank you. And then when it comes to the president's goal of 70% vaccinated by July 4th, Arizona is not going to be one of those states. When do you think we'll get there and why can we not get to 70% by July 4th? So we might be one of those states that gets to it. So of the adult population, and I'd have to have my team go back and figure out what the denominator is. So when we're presenting the 46 or 51, that's over the entire 7.3 million population. We'd be closer if we just went with the adult population or the eligible population. You know, we continue to work. We know that there's a lot of um, misperceptions out about the vaccine. We know that there's a lot of people who are, are hesitant and want to see 
you know, others who have taken the vaccine and see how it turns out for them before they get it. So we're going to continue to work. We would love to hit that 70 percent goal um, by uh, July 4th, but we're going to continue working whether whether we get that or not. Okay, and then just my last question, you know, there's been some evidence for quite some time. You kind of showed the chart showing daily vaccinations at the state run sites uh, dropping, especially since the beginning of May. So I'm just curious why you're waiting until now to stop when you could have started a focus sooner on trying to get into the pop-up events. You know, I just covered a Buckeye pop-up event this oh, good. week. It's the first one that far west, though. So I'm just curious why we didn't switch sooner. Uh, it, you know, we could have started a month ago. So we've started participating in those pop-up events a while back. Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that we made it through. We didn't know what the demand for 12 and above was going to be. We do know that, you know, with with Pfizer, we were able to do that. So we wanted to make sure that we we made it through that, saw that demand. But we've also been watching what's going on, like, you know, Michigan. We wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be a big surge in cases and that it wasn't going to stand, you know, we weren't going to get a huge demand or rush for vaccine. What we've identified is, um, you know, we've got decreased demand. We want to make sure that we give people enough notice to where if this was something that was their plan to get both doses, they've got that ability. We are going to phase out. Um, but we did want to give notice to the public before just completely shutting them down as well. We can, if there is another demand, we can stand these sites up relatively quickly. We stood State Farm up in about five to six days. Um, so if there was a big push for demand or we had a surge in cases, we would just be able to stand up sites and vaccinate people as well. But you will see us now even, even participating more in the community events. Done with questions, and we will go on to Howard Fisher. Hi, Howie. Hi, how are you today? I'm good. How are you today? Good. Let me start off with where Nicole put the drop off, uh, and you know, I realized you know 70 percent of what lies there in lies in statistics, and I'll leave that aside. Yeah. But using even just CDC figures uh, and their reporting, we are 36 in the nation, um, and. Uh, the numbers just seem to be lagging the rest, much of the rest of the country. What is it about Arizona or Arizonans that makes us so much more hesitant than, let's say, the people in Maine or even California? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, you know, I, historically, Arizona has had pockets of vaccine hesitancy even before COVID-19. So I think that that, you know, that kind of set a baseline. We've been seeing declining um, vaccination rates in Arizona. Um, so that may play a role in it. I think, you know, a, a lot of Arizonans are, are independent. They want to they wanna make these decisions on their own. Um, we're working on getting that information out and answering individual questions the best that we can. And, and we're just going to keep working. But I, I think that there's a number of factors that play a role in why we're slowing down. So do you have a number that you think we're actually going to get to since um, uh, you know, whatever denominator you want to use, but do you have a number yeah. that you think we can realistically get to? I would like to think that we could realistically get to 70%. Um, you know, we see lower flu vaccination numbers. I think COVID it has been more present and more on people's mind than influenza is. Um, so I would, be, I would be hopeful that we'd be able to get more than we normally get for influenza. I'd like to get to the 70%, um, but it, it's so hard to put a, a number um, when you have to go talk to people individually to now, now start encouraging people to get vaccinated. Second questions deal with the issue of the a number of incidents in nursing homes and such. Uh, your, your trustworthy press aide has said, well, it's, we're just backfilling in numbers. It's going to go back you know, months. But yet I don't see that same backfilling going on in other non-congregate uh, care settings. I mean, how much of this is, you know, congregate care settings have just opened up? I mean, I can tell you from my mother's own facility, uh, are we actually seeing any increase there now that they're opening up and allowing visitors in? 
So I, I would have to check with the team on that, Howie. I'm not hearing of significant outbreaks in our long-term care facilities right now. They, there may be cases. I mean, we've obviously got COVID-19 in our community. Um, what you are seeing, the majority of those cases or of those events is, is the back cleanup. So they're going through, they're looking at the cases that were identified, they're looking at, at the outbreaks. In some cases, um, things that had been included as part of one outbreak were actually identified to potentially be two separate outbreaks because the cases occurred too far apart to be considered the same outbreak. So that will increase the numbers. Usually around the mid of the year, almost with all of our diseases, you will see us doing the cleanup from the year before because we consider that data complete. Um, I, I think with, you know, most of our data is done on a yearly basis. So for us to continue doing this aggregate count past a year has provided some challenges, especially when you're looking retrospectively at, at the past data. But the same similar kind of thing happens when you're looking at our opioid deaths when we do that final cleanup. Um, you will see that those numbers jump. And it's just a, we, we are able to finalize, we're able to, to appropriately categorize, you know, if, if it truly was a case, if it was part of an outbreak, what facility it was at, because we've got, we've got more information than we had during the event. Yeah. And then finally, you talked about other childhood vaccines. Yeah. You know, most states allow medical exemptions. Uh, some states allow religious exemptions. We're one of a few states that allows the parents to have a personal exemption, simply saying, I don't think so. Uh, what's your thought on having a personal exemption uh, without a religious or a medical reason? And, you know, do we need to, to, to look at that? Uh, you know, last time I looked, we were somewhere in the 6% range mm -hmm. of, of folks with personal exemptions. I'm hoping to get some more recent data, but what's your whole feeling on this whole idea that we can just allow parents to say, I'm gonna not going to get my kids MMR or whatever it is? So I, I, I am a big proponent of childhood immunization. Um, my, my kids are fully vaccinated. I, I think all children... I, I, I would say that immunizations were one of the most powerful public health tools that we had um, in preventing some of the, in preventing significant diseases like polio and measles where they disabled and killed children. I think as we've gotten farther out and those diseases become less prevalent, so people don't see the devastating impacts like that our parents saw. Um, with those, the immunization in their mind becomes more dangerous than the actual threat of disease. Although we know that these diseases are still in the world. Um, we would like, I mean, I, I understand that we are a big parental uh, state cho or parental choice state. That's why we have the philosophical options so that parents can make the decisions that they feel best are for their, that are best for their children. You know, we implemented a pilot program that in order to exempt out, parents had to find, had to watch a video online to be able to learn more about the vaccine so that they were able to answer those questions before they were able to opt out. Um, and, and so really trying to hope that giving them the information may make them more um, open to having their child vaccinated against some of these just truly devastating diseases. Did the videos make any difference in the end? You know, it was, uh, we put together a study. I think they're still looking at some of the data because it was difficult because some schools didn't routinely do it on everybody. So um, it looks like it may have made a little bit of difference, but I don't have the exact data to be able to, to share with you right now. So bottom line, should Arizona get rid of the personal exemption? <laughs> I, I don't know that, that that's my decision. I want all kids vaccinated because I want to keep all kids healthy and able to reach their full potential. Come on, okay. you're the chief I'm, public health officer. I'm not a policymaker, Howie. Oh, come on. Anyway, thank you, doctor. Thanks, Howie. Now to Bud Foster, Tucson. Hi, Bud. Hello, Dr. Press. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for doing this. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, they did a survey here in Pima County to determine, ask people why they won't get vaccinated, 58% of the people said because it's not safe. Another 35% said the government's just not going to tell me what to do. Um, but one of the interesting things 
is that 40% of the people said that they would get a shot if they got a gift card or if they got some other kind of incentive. This seems to have worked in other states. Arizona continues to lag behind. Why not put something out there for these folks who are kind of sitting on the fence who say, give me a gift card, I'll get a shot? So those those are things that we are looking at right now. We're working with our, our, our local partners. Um, that's one of the, you know, the things that we're testing with our Diamondbacks event up here at Chase Field. I know that Pima County has implemented some incentives and we're gonna look to potentially increase that as we move forward um, and trying to identify some of the best ways to potentially be able to do that. But we have seen that there have been successful programs in other states and are looking to see how those how those turn out. Cash seems to work pretty well. Um, and, and another thing here in Pima County, another question, um, there are pop-ups. Um, and I know that the state is going to rely on pop-ups. Uh, the pop-ups here in Pima County, they show that 47% of the people who respond to the pop-ups and get shots are from the Hispanic community. And as we know, the Hispanic community lags behind um, very much uh, early on. Um, can you kind of put a number on it and say how, how much the state is doing, what kind of a number the state is doing on that population we, with your pop-ups? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I'd probably, I don't have that data off the top of my head. I know that we've been focusing on um, communities that are underserved or communities of color to help increase those vaccination rates. But um, I don't know that we have those numbers. I'm looking at Steve by specific event. Um, so let us look into that and see if that's something that, that we can get you. I know the state pods, we do post that on our website, but those are much different than the, than the, um, the community pop-up events. Okay, and then one final thing is is that we have a lot of vaccine and, and not a lot of demand for it right now. Here in Pima County, there's talk about maybe sharing that with uh, the folks down in Sonora. Um, what do you think about that? Is that a possibility? Is that something the state's looking at? Is that something that we might want to do? So we are working with our federal partners right now. CDC has um, said that we are not allowed to share that vaccine internationally. So with either Canada or or Mexico. Um, the federal government is looking at um, providing uh, the, some of the excess vaccine to international partners, Mexico and Canada being um, some of those, and are looking. I know we've, um, I was just on a call earlier where I said, you know, that when, when we've got border communities that, you know, people cross and go back and forth every day. Um, so those border communities, be, if they are unvaccinated, pose a significant risk. Um, to United States communities. They said that they were, the federal partner said that they were specifically working on that and that President Biden had made an announcement. And um, the best way to get vaccine internationally is to enroll um, into the federal pool, which Arizona does donate uh, doses to the federal pool. Is there a timetable for that? I don't know. I haven't heard a timetable, but, but we can double check on that. Great, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'll get with Steve to find out how your pop-ups are doing with my more conversation. But thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Next is Peter Seymour. Hi, Peter. Hello, Dr. Chris, good afternoon. Uh, quick follow-up, does health services have any money for incentives? Now that the state sites are closing by the end of the month, um, could any funds be transferred over to pay for incentives? And if not, who would pay for the incentives for state events? So we are looking into that. So we did receive federal funding to help with vaccination, with health equity of vaccination and, and those types of things. We could use some of that funding for potential incentives, but then partners can utilize um, different incentives that they have as well. So there is a little bit of funding for us to be able to do that um, and partner with entities to provide. Okay. Yeah, and so then back to the state sites closing yeah. down, what is the messaging or the logistics for shutting down all the sites? Uh, I know they're not happening all on June 28th. It's uh, gradual, as you said in your presentation, but what's, uh, what's it going to look like, closures on the state -run sites? Yeah, so what it's going to look like is um, we'll be phasing down. So you've seen decreased hours of operations and decreased days. As we get closer to, um, to a potential or to the closing date of each of the sites. The sites will start to 
add in incorporate messaging. If you're getting a first dose, here's where you can get your second dose because this pod won't be open anymore with information about which pods will be open until uh, when. So um, we will we'll continue to message that. And then what'll happen is as they shut down, they'll come off of our website and then they need to demobilize to be out of those facilities um, by the end of June. So that means uh, whoever's running the clinics or the pods on your behalf or even with the state story, if they got a bunch of equipment to move around uh, or put it in storage somewhere, iPads, have places to go, stuff, stuff like that? Yeah, so we'll be working with our partners um, at uh, DEMA and the partners that are managing the sites, yes, to, to pack up the, the infrastructure, to, to put it away, to return it if it was borrowed, those kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, but we will still have the ability to ramp back up if we need to, if there was a significant demand in vaccine that we felt we needed a mass vaccination site for. And why will Gila River Arena be the last to close? Um, they, it, it was well one, it was, you know, State Farm was the first to open. Glendale, uh, you know, we've been, we've been working on that site. That one is the one that has, um, been we we did not reduce the days uh at that site so that's still open seven days a week um and had the most availability without blockout dates or closures to go to the 28th so it was it was more of a um just logistical uh perspective that that one stayed open but it's kind of nice because that area was the first the first that we opened and it'll be the last to close the swan song so to speak over there yeah. Uh, and then one last thing, quick, finally, I'm sorry to go so long, but uh, are you concerned about a potential outbreak again if we don't reach 70% by the 4th of July, especially as people who do not have adequate response to the vaccines? Are, we, are, you, are, you, are you concerned at all about, uh, again, another outbreak of coronavirus? I, I think we're always watching for a potential surge in cases, um, you know, given the so many unknowns about COVID-19. Um, and potential variants. I think where we are right now, we've seen a significant um, stabilization of the cases and hospitalization. What we would hope is that even if we got a significant um, number of cases that our vulnerable populations have been significantly um, immunized and that would prevent potentially hospitalizations and deaths. Um, so it, it's hard to predict now. I don't know that it's um, the fact that we wouldn't be at 70% because we do have a significant number of Arizonans vaccinated. It's not as high as we would like, but we also know that some people will have some immunity. Um, we don't know how long it lasts, but if they've recently been infected with COVID, um, you know, they may have a level of protection and people haven't gone completely back to normal, which I think also slows some of that transmission, but it's always something that we're, we're at the watch out, on the watch for. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Peter. Next is Stephanie Ennis. Hey, Stephanie. Hi, Dr. Christ. Um, so on that 70% of yeah. adults, I did look at the CDC numbers, and we've got 58% in okay. Arizona of our adults have been vaccinated. And President Biden declared June, you know, a, he called it a month of action to reach this 70%. So does Arizona have any action plan on the next month in terms of getting from 58 to 70? So, yeah, so, um, you know, we've awarded those those contracts to the pop-up providers. We're working with our county health departments um, to identify potential strategies. So I know uh, Pima County has been looking at some incentives. Maricopa County has been working uh, alongside of us with the One Community Initiative to increase some of those those pods. We are also looking at um, doing some more town halls, some more of that direct outreach here, um, as well as you know just being out in the community as much as we can to promote to promote that. Um, some of the other things that we are doing is looking to work with our school districts for back to school vaccination events to get more of those adolescents vaccinated and hopefully establish some events so that when. Um, one of the vaccines gets approved for all ages, we're ready to go and to um, be ready to vaccinate even younger Arizonans to get up to that, that number. But um, we continue to work with partners on expanding our vaccine access. 
And you say that we may not reach 70%, but you're going to keep trying, right? To do that in terms of reaching a by July 4th. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to predict given the slowing that we've gotten. You know, it, because like you, you hear such different things. You hear the people that are the wait and see. But if there was an uptick in cases, maybe those wait and see would be like, all right, I'm not going to wait and see anymore. I'm going to I'm going to get vaccinated. We've also heard a number of people who were waiting until their kids were out of school. So their kids didn't miss school or they've got a family vac a vacation that they don't want the kids to potentially have side effects on. And so, you know, really kind of seeing where the community is and where they are. So we could reach that 70 percent i just am fearful with with our slowdown and the the decreased demand um it's going to make it harder to reach that 70 percent but i'm hopeful that arizona would okay that's great and the last thing is um are, are you targeting i guess you've contracted with um these um groups to help identify who you want to vaccinate i mean is is there any particular group like white men i'm just throwing that out there that you know is, is you particularly are trying to focus on whether it's demographics or geographics yeah so there's a couple of different ways that we're looking at the vaccination data um you know looking at geographically where are there low rates where do we know that there are um, people that have higher uh rates of covid 19 disease that have uh, identified bad outcomes like hospitalizations or death targeting those geographic areas but then we're also working with partners to target some of those groups that we may know, um, you know, may need a little bit uh, additional reach out and assistance. So looking at, again, geographic um, areas, you know, reaching out to veterans who may not have as much access um, and different groups like that. And some of the, the external groups are partnering with us to help develop that messaging and those strategies. And our local health departments are continuously working on this as well. Can you name any of those groups that that need more help? I know that we um, are looking at um, uh, working with our veteran population um, to, to help increase vaccination. I know that we are looking at our African-American um, uh, adult men um, and looking at that population. Some of our younger uh, men in general, so looking across at our 18 to like 30 year olds, those that may not be impacted by COVID-19 but have lower vaccination rates. So some of those are some of the groups that we're looking at developing specific messaging for. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Our last question is from Jared at the Mirror. Hi, Jared. Hi, oh, thank you for are. taking the time to uh, ask the question from us. Yeah. Um, I was. I wanted to ask you about. You know, we're seeing uh, a downward trend in you know cases, and you know, this time last June, uh, we were seeing in, in, you know kind of our first surge in, in, in cases. Um, but right now we're seeing a you know a decrease in cases. We're just seeing a decrease in positivity. But you know, when you look at the data, one of the things that I was curious to, to ask you about, and, and 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 I was curious about is we're still seeing a large number of COVID cases in our emergency uh, beds. Um, and we're still seeing, you know, there's not very many cases of, of COVID taking up hospital beds, but we still have, you know, say 14% of ICU beds are available. You know, whereas before the, the first June surge of last year, we had about 36 to 24% of our available space ICU beds available. I was curious as to, you know, why we still have, you know, while we're seeing these dramatic decrease in COVID numbers, why are we still seeing a large percentage of COVID cases in our emergency beds? And also, why are we still kind of having this issue with uh, a lack of um, ICU beds while we have this decrease in COVID? Yeah, so, so those are all uh, really great questions. Um, you know, we kind of use not so much the number in the emergency departments, um, but the, uh, the, um, the changes in that. So, you know, we could see that when we started to see several days of increasing ED, when you look back, it's kind of a, it was a early predictor for uh, in increasing cases. So we watch that. Um, it's hard to tell because they are self-reported. So is that everybody who's coming into the emergency room that's getting a, um, uh, a COVID test is being counted? Is it everybody who comes in with respiratory illness? is being counted, it's a little bit different. So we look at the trends. When we look at our COVID-like illness for emergency departments, we have seen that it's 
it's decreased pretty significantly since January. So we use all of those pieces. Um, to touch on the, uh, the, you know, when you look at the availability of beds and how it's remained stable at about 13, 14% if you're looking at our ICU bed usage, but the uh, number of beds, while the capacity of total beds being used hasn't changed all that much, the, the number of those beds being taken by um, COVID patients has reduced significantly. And we have a couple of theories on, on what that is. One, we know that a lot of people delayed care um, during the COVID pandemic, whether they were afraid to go into doctor's offices or you know, they, they wanted to put it off to make sure that there, was, uh, that there was capacity in the hospital for those that truly needed it. What we know is when, when people delay care that have significant medical issues, um, they may need more significant care when they finally present. So I think the hospitals are um, you know, working through that patient population and the patients that put off surgical procedures or um, were considered elective during um, when we held elective surgeries to ensure that there was hospital capacity. All of that now is being caught up, which may um, increase uh, the, the total capacity of beds in use. And so um, we don't know because we didn't, before COVID, we didn't collect um, the capacity data like we're collecting now. So we don't know if that would go back down once they were able to kind of get through those patients or if that's their normal capacity that they normally operate at. And we just didn't know that back at the beginning of the pandemic. So that's all information that we continue to, to learn about. Do you have another question? Yeah. Um, Dr. Chris, it's not quite two o'clock, and Bud Foster is back with another yeah. question. Oh, that's fine. I will put Bud um, on here. Oh, I, I just oh. Have, I just have something very quickly. Oh, to please ask do. You. You, yeah. you continue to say that demand is decreasing. Can you put a number on that? Can you kind of give me an idea of where it doesn't have to be specific, but just kind of how much the demand has decreased from, say, the peak until where we are now? Um, I can give you, you know, uh, numbers like at our state pod. So at our peak week, we administered over 169,000 doses of vaccine um, that week, um, which was, I believe, back in the end of March. It was it was the week that we, we were able to open up. And during one of those days, we did administer over 12,000 doses of vaccine at State Farm Stadium. When you look at that compared to last week, we administered about 13,000 doses at our state pods last week. So that's a significant decrease. Now, given that um, we might have seen even more of a decrease last week, because I think the week before that, it was the weeks before that, it was somewhere between 20 and 50,000 a week, which is still a significant decrease from 169,000. Um, but last week with the holiday, people may not have wanted to go close as we got closer to the holiday because they may not want to wanted to have side effects over that weekend. So last week may be an anomaly, but even 169,000 to a decrease of 50,000 a week is a significant decrease in vaccine demand at our sites. All right. Thank you very much. That's what I was really looking forward to. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time to join us and have a great weekend. Thank you, Dr. Christ. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend.